uh, this is very, it's a great opportunity. To be honest, um, I, it's, it's the first time that I do a talk like this online. And we usually, we tend to do these things in, in person, going to visit labs and talk to people about their work. And, but we also try to, uh, to, to explain what we do and, uh, and how we do it and, uh, and, and the type of papers that we want, what it is that we want for our journals. We, it's important for us to tell people uh, things, the detail, to give them details about the, the process of choosing the papers that we want to publish even uh, when, um, uh, you know, beyond the simple interaction that we can have by email, okay? So what I want to talk about today is I chose this topic, nature, not technology, energy in the environment. So I'll talk about the journals that I work for, and I'd like to give you a little bit of an insight of our view of those topics of how nanotechnology can help with the energy and the environment. But before that, I would like to give you some insight into how the nature, how nature, nature nanotechnology fits within the, the, uh, the publishing group of nature research. So what is, what are, what is a nature journal and, and uh, how the various nature journals are uh, connected to each other. Then I'll introduce the nature technology and I will expand a little bit on the scope and on, on particularly on energy and environment. And I would like to finish on some of the, um, of the recent uh, approaches that we have taken to improve standards, both in terms of uh, data and in terms of reproducibility. And I, I've decided to keep it relatively short compared to the, to this, uh, to the rest of the series. So I'm, probably going to talk about for 40 minutes because I really want to give the options to people to ask me questions of, of any type. I'll, I'll give you a list of things that I can discuss about, but also if you have questions of any other type, I'm very happy to take them. So first of all, I, like to, to, I would like to really emphasize the fact that every year, the number of papers published is just enormous. And it's something that, you know, I probably don't need to tell you, but just to give you an idea, only in nanotechnology, so all, all those papers that are tagged as nanotechnology papers, there are about 180,000 per year. And that is about 500 per day. Seems like just a simple number, but it's 500 papers per day in nanotechnology. So imagine how much information is distributed every day. And it's just impossible to just follow it all for anyone. So these papers are published in any type of, in many type of journals. There are journals that, uh, that are really focused on, on general uh, science or multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary science, some that are more specialized. There are some that are uh, open access, some that are not open access, and even within the open access community, there are the various formats of journals. And also there is a lot of um, uh, activity on trials for peer review or new types of peer review and on, on ways to improve the, the system and on uh, to improve the transparency of the process, but also on, on ways to make the peer review fairer and more accurate and so on. So what I will focus is one type of publication, which is the nature type of publication. And I will uh, try to explain you what that means. First of all, uh, nature was launched, the actual magazine Nature was launched uh, about 150 years ago. I'm now wearing, I'm not sure if you can see it, I'm wearing a 150 anniversary uh, t-shirt that I was given as a, as a present uh, at the meeting last year. And the idea of the journal was that it had to report for a general audience the most significant results in all branches of sciences. And it's 150 years on, the, the purpose of the goal of the journal is still the same. I always like to think that uh, it's the, the, the target audience is more a generic scientific audience rather than a generic audience. Although there are parts in the, on the magazine that, are, uh, that could be appreciated by a wider audience than just scientists. It's a privately owned journal, so that means it is not associated with any uh, scientific society. So in many ways, that makes it even more independent. And it was launched in London. It was actually called Nature London for a long time, but it's now uh, at offices around the world. The biggest one is still in London, but a big one also is in New York, one in Shanghai, and one in Berlin that has uh, been opened two or three years ago. But for, well, 
probably 120 years, 130 years, what, uh, Nature was the only journal of the group. And it was just around the 80s, in fact, that uh, there was a recognition of the fact that Nature was being very selective in publishing, indeed, the most significant results. But uh, there are many more scientific results that were left out, that were still uh, worth sharing with a wide audience, but not necessarily, uh, not necessarily at the level of Nature. So the decision was taken to start launches more specialized journals. Um, with still high selectivity. The first one was launched was Nature Biotechnology, if I'm not wrong, Nature Medicine came after. And it was only, uh, most of the journals launched initially were all in the, um, in the life sciences. And it was only in 2002 that the first journals in the fecal sciences at the time there was Nature Materials was launched. And that was followed by Nature Physics, Nature Nanotechnology, Nature Chemistry. And here I'm just giving you a, a glimpse of a few of them that there are I actually have lost count, but there must be around 50 uh, research journals. One point that I want to make is also the fact that there has been a, a concerted decision from the company to focus not just on, some, on let's say, classic scientific disciplines, chemistry, um, physics, and so on, but also on launching journals that are so-called thematic journals that really have to uh, explore the role of uh, science in, in solving the grand challenges of humanity. Uh, the first one, the first journals that launched was Nature Climate Change, Nature Energy, Nature Human Behavior, Sustainability, Nature Food, all uh, January this year. And the launch of the journals is of course a, the, the clearest step in that direction, but there is a wider uh, importance given to these topics within, within the, the company and within the, uh, the publishing group. And so also within individual journals that are maybe not traditionally related to, this, uh, to these topics. I'm saying this because particularly when I when we'll talk about natural nanotechnology, this is an important point I want to make. So I'll show you uh, the nature and nature journals. Nature Communications was launched in 2010 and this was the first uh, open access journal launched by the group, uh, the publishing group of Nature. And the idea of Nature Communications is that it, it covers the same breadth of topics as Nature, but there is no such, so much emphasis on the, on the wide interest, and the interest for a, for a very generic, generic audience. So the, of course, the, the papers are supposed to be high quality and report important advance. Uh, but the, different, the main difference is indeed it is open access. It, it was launched as a hybrid journal and then very rapidly became a fully open access journal. If we go below nature communications in terms of the significance of the papers, uh, there, there come the, here come the communications journals. If you like, the, the best way to, that I have to describe the, these journals is that their relationship to nature communications is the same as nature journals to nature itself. So the first three journals that were launched were communications biology, chemistry, and physics, and very recently the, uh, also communications materials has, has launched. And to be fair, I expect this to be a very successful journal as well. Uh, scientific reports finally is the one, if you want, uh, that stays at the bottom of the, of, the, of, the, of the pile in the sense that in terms of significance is the one at the bottom because there is no real emphasis on the wide significance of the results. It is really meant to be conceived as a venue for any uh, result that is technically valid to be published. And um, it's also open access. And the, the main difference with the other nature journals and the reason why there, it, it doesn't have the name nature in front of it is that it is, uh, it, it also has the, the help of external editors unlike the nature journal themselves. So just to give you a, a, a big summary, if you go in terms of significance from the, bottom, from the top to the bottom, there's nature, nature research journals, nature communications, communications journals, and scientific reports. And as you can see from, from this slide, nature and the nature research journals are subscription journals. They don't allow open access and everything else is open access. So in terms of volumes, probably uh, Springer Nature, which is our publisher, is, is probably is the, the publisher that publishes most content open access, but nature and nature journals are not open access. 
I should say not of an access yet. Uh, there are certainly uh, conversations and, uh, and plans to see what can be done to publish uh, at least some of the compasses, not all open access, and eventually even all of it open access. But this is this is something that well we, we don't know yet. It's something that is coming in the future. Right. So let's focus a little bit on national technology. So national technology was launched in two thousand and six, and really it has the purpose of publishing the most significant results in nanoscience and nanotechnology. It's based in London, Berlin, and Shanghai, in the sense that the editors, which are six of them, uh, including myself, are in London, Berlin, and Shanghai. Three of us are in London, two are in Berlin, one is in Shanghai. And I'll just show you quickly a picture of, of what these editors are, just not, be, not for any other reason, just to, but to give you an idea of what is the breadth of expertise that we have in our, in our, um, in our team. So I divided these mostly in chemists and physicists, so we have three broadly speaking chemists and three broadly speaking physicists, even if, for example, Benjamin is here on the right, is in fact a, a chemistry in terms of master degree and a, and a physicist in terms of PhD. I am definitely a physicist. Olga is an engineer by training, but then he has, she has a, um, a PhD in physics. And Alberto is a physical chemist. Chiara Pastor is a, is a structural chemist. And Wenji is, a, is also, uh, she's also studied surface chemistry and biochemistry. The idea is that also that what I want to emphasize is that, uh, so Alexei pointed out that I, I am a researcher. I'm not anymore, as a matter of fact, I was a researcher. So all of us are fully, uh, full-time editors. We, are, we don't do research anymore, but we come from research. So we have experience in research. Most of us, they, we all have a PhD and except for one of us, which is, who is Wenji, everybody else has a postdoc experience as well. So the idea is that an editor for a nature journal is not necessarily somebody who can write well or can uh, edit well. Of course, we have to be able to write because we communicate with authors and editors. But the most important um, skill that we look for when we employ a new editor is the ability to assess a scientific manuscript. Of course, we, we don't have to understand the details of every single subject. But important, uh, the important aspect that we look for is that somebody that has to be able to read the paper, understand what it's about, understand whether the results are, are important within the, the field, and, and also evaluate more or less what the good points and the bad points are, and therefore deciding whether they are suitable for the journal or not. 70% of the work we do is indeed on that, assessing manuscripts. And we do all the, the work, so there's no editorial board. Very often still now, after many years, I receive, uh, I receive uh, emails from authors saying, oh, yeah, I think you should really contact the editorial board for this. There is no editorial board. We take all the decisions. So we can ask experts to give us a hand, but eventually the responsibility of the decision is with us. So 70% of the work is that. 30% of the work is more like in commissioning, editing, writing, and attending conference do, uh, when, when it's possible to travel, of course. Uh, but also in these days, we're trying to attend conferences or having meetings with people, with researchers uh, online. And sometimes we also it's time, it's time we spend doing these kind of things. So you know, discuss about, talk to people about what we do and how we do it. So what is nanotechnology for us? This is a very important slide that I added only recently in my talks because the, the eventually nanotechnology if you ask different people, they tell you different things because for them, there's always a different meaning. You know, if for some people, it's simply everything which has to do with materials that are within uh, a range of one to 100 nanometers. Uh, historically, people think about nanotechnology as really the manipulation of matter atom by atom, which is certainly part of it. For us, nanotechnology has, is anything which has to do with the growth properties, applications, and implication on nanomaterials. And with nanomaterials, we really mean any material for which the, uh, the properties are dictated by the fact that one or more of the dimensions are at the nanoscale. So uh, that, I say that because that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that it has to be between one and 100 nanometers. You can have, if I take the example of quantum dots, which is a topic I'm familiar with because I was working on that as a researcher, depending on what the material is, 
the different a nano a nanoscale a nanocrystal can be below 10 nanometers or below one nanometers depending on when the properties change with respect to the bulk so there are materials for which the fact of being at the nanoscale changes the properties with respect to the bulk that's what it is a nanomaterial for us that that's what nanotechnology is so everything which has to do with the synthesis of the or the fabrication of these uh, materials or the characterization the study of the fundamental properties of these nanomaterials to be used in various applications, the actual realization of devices or the investigation of the applications in of these nanomaterials, which can be in many fields. Classically, it would be electronics, but it could be in energy, it could be in environment, it could be in biology and medicine particularly. This is particularly relevant at the moment, of course. And eventually, I. Uh, I include in this call also the implications of nanomaterials. With implications, I mean the effect on the environment or on, uh, on, the, uh, on the human. So this is what is normally called as ecotoxicology or nano-ecotoxicology and nano human nanotoxicology. Right, so I, what is the type of papers that we look for, right? The, uh, the idea is that what we look for has to have high significance. So what does this mean? So even as, as editors, when we assess whether the manuscript is suitable or not for the journal, so before even we ask the opinion of referees, we have to decide whether it really is an important advance with respect to, uh, to the existing literature within the field. So of course the paper has to be original and technically sound, but this is a necessity. I mean, for every paper should be technically sound and original. It cannot be a rep really necessarily something that you've already published, and and it has to be technically sound. That otherwise it shouldn't be published. So to be published in, in Nature and Technology and every other Nature Research Journals, it has to be a substantial advance of the previous work. This means that it should be conceptually novel, but also technologically important. And I really want to emphasize the technological importance. The technological the technological importance. Because from uh, traditionally, the nature publications, nature itself and nature publications are really focused on conceptual novelty. But the, again, in the recent years, and particularly among some of the journals that are more technologically oriented, I mean, electronics will be another one of them, catalysis will be another one of them, energy, but nanotechnology as well, we really are looking more and more about the advance from a technological perspective. So rather than looking at conceptual novelty, we look at whether a, a, a result is important for the community. And it can be important because it introduces a new idea, but it, it could be important because it achieves a certain technological uh, goal that has the potential to be really followed up by other people. And that is, I think, uh, this thing about following up the results is the most important aspect of what we look for. So all these, these uh, bullet points that are put there, including the broad interest, it, they are easy to say, but in, in fact, uh, it's, it's still very vague. And the most important thing is that, the most important aspect that we really look for is that we read the paper and we try to decide, are the results so significant? And even somebody who is a scientist, but not necessarily a scientist in this topic, would be able to recognize that these are important results, okay, without looking at the details, just to understand, okay, I can understand that the field was here now, due to this result, this could have an important, uh, it could be important because other people are going to take this result and, and, and uh, develop them further. further. And that's, that's the, main, uh, the main aspect that we look for. Right, so I, I was talking about the technological importance and I wanted to mention this, uh, this idea that especially since I joined, so already from when I joined the, the Journal of Natural Technology, which is 2012, my idea was that uh, uh, for many years, nanotechnology was hailed as the new solution for all the problems of the world, right? Um, but reality, in reality, that didn't really happen, or maybe, maybe not in the way that uh, had been described at the beginning. But what I wanted to do was really focus the journal on how could, how could nanotechnology really contribute to those, uh, to those technologies. So we, uh, we, we have done, uh, we, we have tried to publish results of this type, both in energy, in environment, 
uh, in food, in water, and and uh, and we're trying to expand on this uh, on on these topics as well. So, I just report showing you now a series of papers that should give you an idea of what we look for in our technology, particularly and energy and the environment. Because, you know, energy, for example, is described in many, many journals, but, but uh, what do we look for necessarily? And again, is the, is the role of nano, nanomaterials there. Now, the next slide, which I've already put there, if you have been fast, you would have already noticed what it is, is about a paper that, this is, seems like uh, I've done on purpose, but actually I gave this exact talk some time ago and not, so it wasn't, I was not invited by Alexei Tarasov, but in fact, the first paper is, is one of his. And the reason why I chose this paper is that it really, and Alexei, please correct me if I, if I say something wrong, but here he really the importance, at least from my perspective, and the reason why I decided to, to, to pursue this paper was not necessarily something conceptually novel because uh, Alexei and his, uh, and his collaborators had already worked on the concept but it was really the demonstration and the con confirmation that uh, this particular technique to, to grow uh, to, to fabricate um, photovoltaics based on perovskites could lead to uh, scalability of, of, the, of the devices and stability of the devices so for me the real important thing here was look at uh, large, large cells and stable cells. So this is a clear demonstration of a paper that was really looking more at aspects important for applications rather than necessarily for, for conceptual novelty. Uh, in this case, uh, also similarly, uh, this is about batteries, so still energy, but it's about batteries. This was, again, a, a nanostructure carbon fiber material that was used to avoid the dendrite, the dendrites that form usually into, uh, into the anodes, into lithium anodes in, 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 um, in batteries. And by using this technique, this allowed to avoid the dentrification and therefore improve the, the cyclability of, of batteries. And, and so this is another example of something that was really uh, aimed at applications. This one is about catalysis, and there was the use of non-precious metal catalysis, uh, catalyst. Again, uh, this is, it's, a very, um, uh, it's a very extensive study, but the main point was that the demonstration that you, we could use a non-precious metal in principle to achieve the same performance as platinum or, or uh, the, that is stand, the standard type of catalyst that is used, uh, particularly in, uh, in uh, research. Uh, but it is, of course, quite precious metal and therefore expensive. The last one I want to show about the energy is, is a perspective that we published. So this, is, this was something that we commissioned ourselves. It wasn't necessarily something that, uh, that was, sorry, it wasn't something that was submitted to us. My colleague Alberto Scatelli, who deals with, uh, uh, with the topic of, elect uh, of uh, energy storage, decided that it was interesting to see to what extent the uh, the research which is done in academia is actually eventually useful to, uh, to, to real life and therefore to uh, industry that work on this. And so we asked these people who, who actually have connections to industries as well to really uh, uh, try to elucidate what are the differences between the research in academia and the needs of, of industry. And whether there could be a way to bridge that gap. We saw that this was really an important uh, aspect to explore. Let's talk a little bit about environment. Uh, environmental nanotechnology, and uh, which is normally look, it normally looks at the impact of nanotechnology on the environment, and on the other end, the, the, uh, the use of nanotechnology for the environment, we're not particularly, uh, we didn't publish a lot of that. And partly this was due to the fact that it was, it, it's a topic again, which I find that is not always that simple to look for something very conceptually novel. But what, what, what it, the field does though is provide a still results that are important, even if the concept is still the same. So most of the a lot of the results that are published have a real impact on, on, the, on society and principally even on policies. So, uh, we, we, we try to, to show our interest for this field by publish uh, selection of reviews 
commission reviews on various aspects of this field. The first, uh, the, the first such collection of commission uh, material was in 2016, and this again was curated by Alberto Moscatelli, and it was really a series of reviews on uh, nanotechnology for automotive uh, applications. So, you, of, of course, he looked into batteries, he looked into fuel cells, but he also looked at uh, the, the the way in which using nanotechnology could impact, uh, for example, the CO2 emissions. In August 2018, I curated one on, on the use of uh, nanotechnology for water purification. But also, it was a, a, there was also a review looking at the impact of nanotechnology on the pollution of water. And last year in, uh, in, um, in June, we published something on, uh, on nano-enabled agriculture. So looking at uh, nanomaterials for pesticides, for fertilizers, but also on the potential of using nanomaterials for, uh, for monitoring uh, the monitoring diseases, monitoring temperature, monitoring level of pressures in plants, and so on, and also looking at aspects of uh, challenges for legal uh, implementations and for, uh, for, sorry, for legal obstacles in, into the implementation of, uh, of, of nanomaterials and so on. Uh, in terms of papers though, again, very often what we, what we tend to receive and we take a look at and, and consider are papers that are really close to the, um, to the application side. For example, the paper that I'm showing you here is uh, is something that uh, I was particularly interested in because it was providing a solution to a practical problem. So uh, this is about thermal desalination. So it's the use of uh, basically a gradient of temperature to induce a flow into the into through a membrane to a desalination membrane. Now, normally, you know, when, when you do this type of uh, if, this type of devices, uh, you have to use electrodes, and the electrodes tend to tend to oxidize and degrade within, uh, uh, especially in high salinity water. So in uh, either seawater or in brackish water, that is usually what is used. And so the, the, in this paper, the authors were showing that if you used a a membrane which is um, which integrates uh, polymers with carbon nanotubes, you can actually create a, uh, a membrane which acts as, as an electrode as well, but doesn't necessarily, well, doesn't degrade as much as a metal electrode. So, of course, and the, 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 the authors also showed that the, uh, the, uh, the performance could also be high in terms of the desalination selectivity. So this was really, my perspective was really an application oriented paper. Another one that uh, I, I curated last year was uh, was about nanoplastic. This is a, this is something that is uh, reaching uh, uh, more recently, certainly before uh, before the impact of COVID was one of the uh, one of really the rising um, topics in the in, in science, particularly in toxicology, because of course the the idea that microplastic could be very uh, is omnipresent and could be uh, very toxic for the environment for oceans particularly has been around for some time but one of the problems is that when microplastic degrades it it it, it can um it can form smaller pieces that are even invisible to techniques and technologies uh, on monitoring technologies on analytical technologies so uh, one of the problems is really that it's difficult to know to to um, estimate the potential toxic effect of nanoplastic because it's even difficult to monitor nanoplastic to know where it is and where it goes. So in this particular um, work, the authors had, uh, somehow used really the synthesis of nanomaterials to create some, uh, you know, some particles of plastic with a tracker inside, a metal tracker inside, so that they could be used for simulating uh, the uh, the you know the fate of this of nanoplastic in the environment. So they could put them, for example, in the, in the case of this paper, they put this uh, synthesized uh, particles within a wastewater treatment plant and uh, and had a look at what happened to them. And again, I thought I thought that this was instead it was an important uh, result because it showed really how the the synthesis, the synthetic uh, ability of uh, a researcher to do 
nanoplast to to sorry to create nanomaterials uh, is can be used eventually to to study something which is important for for the environment and for society. And the last one I want to show is, is an analysis type of paper. We don't publish a lot of analysis. Analysis is supposed to be, unlike a letter or an article, which is really original research, analysis is original research, but it doesn't look at a new data necessarily. It, is, it, it, um, it explores data that are already published and tries to draw conclusions from those. In this case, for example, uh, the author were trying to compare nano fertilizers nano pesticides with the pesticides and fertilizers in the in the bulk form and to look at uh, the advantages and disadvantages and it was very interesting because the main conclusion from this topic and the reason why i was so interested in it is that it was showing that in most studies on nano the nano pesticides and nano fertilizers the studies do not really look at the mechanism of interaction of the nanoparticle with the plants or with the, with the crops. And that's really an important aspect. So I think it was only in 10% of the, of the publication that the, 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 the group explored, there was some indication of the mechanism of interaction. And this is something that we wanted to emphasize that really this field has to, has to in order to progress in the right way, it has to, uh, it needs that type of, of, of work, that type of insight, looking at the uh, at, at really the mechanistic um, interaction between the crops and the other particles. Right. So this is this this you know uh, this is the last uh, slides on the examples of paper that we publish. And what I wanted the, the last few minutes, I wanted to just uh, show you some of the. Uh, initiatives that were taken as nature nano but also as nature more generally uh, but in order to improve uh, standards standards of reporting standards of uh, um, uh, peer review and so on peer review i'm not going to talk about peer review necessarily now unless you ask me to do that unless you want me to do that uh, this is the first thing that was introduced already a few years ago in fact nature nano technology introduced it in 2014 if I remember correctly, and it's the idea of a reporting summary in the life sciences. So there was an, uh, it was noted by, particularly by pharmaceutical companies, that there was a, uh, a real difficulty in reproducing some results because very often they were, the results were not in, in publications, were taken in different ways from one publication to the other. So at, at publication level, there was a discussion, to, uh, sorry, publishers level with various found, funders and, uh, and um, you know, academic, uh, uh, representative of academia, there was a discussion about what is the minimal, um, the minimal reporting standard for a paper in the life sciences. So in other words, what we are doing, what we do when we ask people to compile, uh, authors to compile a reporting summary is not we're not telling them to do certain things in a certain way. We're just asking them to be very explicit as to how certain exper experiments have been done. Now, I, I have to say, uh, being a physicist, I'm not really an expert of the details of this, but the, the, main, the most important aspect is, is this, that we are asking people to be very explicit about the way they have done their, their experiments, particularly the way for example, how many uh, samples have been used, how many replicas, how many are real replicas, how many are virtual replicas, and so on. And this was uh, adopted by Nature and by all the Life Sciences Journal and by Nature Nano and Nature Materials as well for those papers that are really using animal studies or they are anyway in the life sciences. Something similar has then uh, been done for solar cells papers, for lasers, and then for ecology and evolution, uh, an environment, sorry, for the social sciences. And in those cases, for example, in the solar cells and lasers is really, there's really an emphasis on uh, reporting, for example, whether performance is certified or not, and, and, and so on, and how, on how to, uh, describing how the experiments, on which type of cells they have been done, and so on. And I know that there is an, an attempt to look at even more of this. Now, something that we have done specifically about nanotechnology was publishing this paper already now, uh, I think it was already two years ago, maybe it was about two years ago, I think. Uh, and it was the idea that 
specifically for, for nanotechnology experiment in biology, uh, there is a lack of reproducibility due to the fact that of the specificity of the, of the nanomaterials. So um, we published this perspective that was submitted to us by a large group of authors. Uh, we, well, Frank Caruso was our contact, but in fact, it was a collaboration among really, really quite a big uh, number of authors. And what, we, what the, the, the perspective was suggesting was to create a minimal standard uh, checklist of for looking at the interaction of nanoparticles, or the characterization of nanoparticles, interaction with nanoparticles with the, with the, um, with a, uh, you know, with environment, uh, and uh, and it's, if I remember correctly, was expressing the uh, exploring the toxicity also of these uh, of the materials. And what we did, we really wanted to engage the community with this. It was too difficult for us to decide. On, uh, on what to do exactly with the, with the report, with how to implement a report summary like this. And so we, we, we asked the community to, to respond to us and we published several correspondences, piece of correspondence on this. The outcome is that we really, is, we cannot at the moment, we've decided not to implement anything. We have decided simply that it was an important, uh, was an important uh, discussion to have. But I, we discussed these things with, uh, with this uh, the aspect with uh, community also conferences. And one of the things that, for example, has come out quite clearly is that rather than, uh, than having a reporting summary that could be excluding important topics, it would be much more useful for people to, to, to publish protocols. So to publish not only a method section with a paper, which is something we, stand, we have standard, but to also publish a protocol of a step-by-step -step, um, of, of, you know, of the procedure that's been used step-by-step -step to do a certain experiment. And so what I'm showing you here is the protocol exchange platform that was, uh, was low. it's not the only platform to publish a protocol, but the, pro the protocol exchange platform is, was launched by Nature and is curated by my colleagues at Nature Protocols, but it's completely free and it simply is a repository of protocols. And what is the advantage of putting it here is that um, basically it's, it's really advantageous for authors because it, it, it provides a DOI that can be cited and it also can be updated. For example, if the, if the protocol changes from one experiment to the other or in time, uh, different versions can be, can be uploaded. So what we're trying to do at the moment is exploring within, with the community um, whether what are the papers for which a protocol would really be important for in, in terms of reproducibility and transparency? This is just to show you that for us, uh, improving standards also depends on what the community wants. So we're trying to do this, not just on our own, but by talking to the community and, and, and see what, what, asking for their advice and also uh, not just simply imposing something from the top, uh, but working with the community to decide on what, what are the best uh, route to follow. And the last bit is, the, is, is in fact about data. This is a, an initiative that is taken uh, broadly from the nature group. And it's the idea that in order to make, uh, you know, data more transparent, we promote the deposition and encourage the deposition in public repositories of the data. And so already for a few years, in fact, we have, um, we have implemented a so-called data availability statement. So every paper that is published in a nature journal has to have a data availability statement. That means that the authors have to indicate whether the data are actually deposited in a public repository and in case where, and or they're simply available by the author uh, for if you read up on request. We noticed, however, that uh, since March 2017, which is, I think, the date when we started making the LBD statement compulsory, only uh, less than 12%, so let's say 88% of authors simply said that the authors are available from, from themselves. And we really would like to, to make it more um, common for authors to make the data uh, public. On the other hand, we also know that it's not always that simple to do that in the sense that it's not always as simple to know which data are you really useful. Because the, the idea of doing this, that is not just transparency, but also 
making data that you've taken useful, useful for theoretician, useful for other people who want to uh, improve their protocols and their way to do experiments, uh, useful to, for, for people who want to follow up on a certain work. So we really want to make the data available, easy to access for, for, for people. So what we're doing now is we try to encourage authors in our letters, when we turn our letters, we try to remind our authors to, that we really would like them to do so. And we've even asked, started asking our reviewers to help authors identify which are the data that could be most useful to, uh, to authors, to, for authors to, to share. And um, this is only started, we only started doing this in February this year. This, what, we, what you see is the title of an editorial we wrote about this. Uh, and this is only from February. So we don't really have data at the moment to, to see that whether this has made a difference or not. But I, it's something that we're monitoring and we're following up and hopefully will we'll lead to something in, a, in the next year, for example. Right, so before I close, I just wanted to mention things that I that uh, you know, I normally discuss, but I haven't, I didn't discuss explicitly this time. And if you want to, uh, please let me know, and I can try to discuss any of these. For example, a little bit of the details of the editorial process. So, how do we choose referees? How fast are we? How many papers do we receive? And so on. Also about things uh, about appeals. I mean, can, can, is it possible to appeal, and what is the best way to do so? I haven't really discussed about how we uh, talk or not talk to other journals. And how is it possible to submit the paper from, uh, you know, to one of the journals after it's been, for example, rejected from another one? But also, there are trials that we're doing on peer review. I'm not discussing anything about citations and impact factors, which is something we many authors care about. And of course, there could be other things that you want to discuss and that I uh, that I not even mentioned in this list. And the, uh, before I close, I just wanted to, to say that, you know, we very often, this is something I like to say because it happens to me very often after 15 years still that we receive letters and uh, claiming that we are trying to do, to, that we are very arrogant basically, that we are very arrogant about the way we, we take our decisions and we think that we are the high priests of science, that we decide what, uh, what science, what is important in science and what isn't. The reality is that not, it's not really like that. We, we uh, you know, we, we know we are researchers ourselves to begin with, and uh, we know that science doesn't progress only from very, very uh, big steps. The science progresses by small steps and big steps, and all of them are important in a way or another. But the type of journal, the type of project that we, we work for only looks at, at one type of, uh, of advances. It's just simply our job. And we try to do the best that we can to produce, produce a, a final product which could be interesting for the community. But we do this really, we want to do this in collaboration with that community. For example, you know, the fact that we are, if we are successful is because we have very good reviewers that review our papers. We have very good authors that send us the very good stuff. And eventually we have readers that read our papers and cite them and use them for their work themselves. So, Without that support from the community, we would fail. So we don't like to be uh, dictating what the community should do. We're simply there to produce a product that hopefully will be good for that community. So as part of the community, and also as my audience, I would like to thank you. And if you have any question now, I'm hoping to take them. I'm happy to take them. But also, if you have any other requests for information, the details of our Twitter account, of our uh, of our website and even my email, if you wanted to ask me anything afterwards, is there. So thank you very much for your for your attention.